Welcome to today's event, Powering the Clean Growth Revolution, Making the Opportunity a Reality. My name is Joshua Burke. I'm a Senior Fellow at Policy Exchange. I'm delighted to welcome a large panel for today's event of a variety of expertise. Um, so to my right, we have James Heapy, MP. Uh, to his right, we have Friedrich Kientitz from uh, the VP Legal, External and Government Affairs at Nissan. Um, then we have Lawrence Slay, the CEO of Energy UK. And to my left, um, we have Tom Glover, the UK Country Chairman from RWE. And to his left, we have Rob Jenrick, MP, Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. So, the context to today's event. The Clean Growth Strategy put forward an ambitious plan to decarbonise the UK economy. It showed that decarbonisation and eco economic growth are no longer seen as mutually exclusive. Rather, decarbonisation in itself could be a vehicle for growth. But the pace of decarbonisation in the power sector has been, has been quick, but um, the transport sector and heat uh, remain a, a large challenge. Indeed, the transport sector is now the biggest sectoral emitter. It is important that all sectors work together, particularly road transport, as it becomes increasingly electrified. But before we make the opportunity a reality, more needs to be done. We are currently not on track to meet our fourth and fifth climate change budget. So, with that, to, make, to hear how we make the opportunity a reality, uh, I'll hand over to uh, my panellist, uh, Rob Jenrick. Great. Well, hello, everybody, and um, uh, nice to see you. It's a bit like um, Groundhog Day uh, doing this because we had a clean growth uh, discussion about three hours ago. So to those of you who are in the audience uh, at that one, uh, you had to have got up at 8 a.m., so perhaps some of you had better things to do at that time in the morning. Apologies. Um, but um, I'm very pleased to be here. As I said at that one, one at Claire Perry, who really leads on this within the government and I, uh, I represent the Treasury on these issues. We've both been really heartened at this conference that there have been so many events like this talking about clean growth. And there does seem to be genuine interest, not just from the industries who are understandably representative, but by members as well who see the opportunity, want to hear how we can take it forward, and to understand what I think is the great thing about this debate today, how this fits into our broader challenge of trying to grow the economy and improve productivity. And that, I suppose, is where uh, I fit in at the Treasury, um, working with Claire, because we see the great challenge, probably bigger than the Brexit challenge, uh, I have to try and make this sound sexy because Boris obviously is uh, talking at the same time, so this is a more important issue than Brexit, uh, is how we can uh, tackle our productivity challenge as a country. And that's the challenge that we know we can do, we've done it in the past. In the 1970s, our productivity gap with competitors like the US was 38%. And by taking the right decisions as a country, we had halved that by the late 1980s. So we know that we can tackle the productivity challenge if we make the right long-term decisions, some of which might be difficult ones, but if you have a government with the vision and the determination to do it, you can make it happen. But the productivity gap never went away, and even before the financial crisis, it was opening up again, and then with that crisis, it's opened up very significantly. And as you all know, the statistics today don't make uh, pleasant reading the German economy can do in four days what we can do in five. So if we want to improve living standards in a sustainable way, we have to tackle the productivity challenge. And we're doing that in a range of different ways, improving skills, many of which you will have heard today if you've um, been watching the conference around apprenticeships, the advent of T-levels, trying to get uh, vocational and technical training going again in this country at speed. We're investing in infrastructure, which is will no doubt be a topic we're going to come up uh, and discuss uh, throughout this, this session. But we're investing in infrastructure very significantly, more than we did in the coalition government and more than the last Labour government did. So the first serious decision that Philip Hammond made as Chancellor was to increase the amount of public investment in our infrastructure, roads, rail and digital and energy, by higher levels than we've done since the early 1970s. And that will only come apparent really in the years ahead when we start to see shovels in the ground in those projects. But we have created a £600 billion um, portfolio of projects ranging from giant ones like HS2 and the Lower Thames crossing for roads, full fibre for broadband, uh, which does have, which I'll come back to because it's relevant to this debate, um, to energy projects as well and energy efficiency. So we're taking it very seriously and investing very significant sums of money. Obviously, the challenge for us at the Treasury, as the guardian of 
the taxpayer is to ensure we're spending that money wisely and that the other departments who are undoubtedly passionate about this, like Claire and Greg at the Department for Business, are making the right decisions for the country. And we're also trying to embrace new technology, and this really cuts to the heart of the debate I think we'll have um, in this session, that we want to ensure that the UK remains at the heart of new technologies, many of which have an energy dimension to them, whether it's electric vehicles, business energy efficiency, home energy efficiency, full fibre, which will enable us to roll out smart energy in people's homes in the years to come. We want to ensure the UK is well positioned, not just to take advantage of it, but actually to create it, to have the research and the development here in the UK. Now, on the energy front, we've done a number of interventions just in the last couple of years. Through the industrial strategy, we're investing around two and a half billion pounds in some of these projects. Some you'll be familiar with, like the Faraday challenge for battery technology, which I think could be very important. Uh, other challenges around nuclear uh, technology, decommissioning of nuclear, um, significant increases in energy efficiency, renewables, um, and very happy to answer some of the questions about those. Electric vehicles is an area we've put a great deal of money and thought into as to how we can roll that out at pace across the country and get the, um, the, uh, the technology but also the infrastructure into communities, not just your big cities, the obvious places that would take it, but also into towns as well. And at the last budget, we at the Treasury created a £400 million fund to try and get that, um, that technology out there and to use the planning system intelligently to do that. So we're certainly putting significant sums of money against this, but the challenges, I think, for us, the central questions for us at the Treasury are how can we make decarbonisation and clean growth the servant of economic growth rather than something that holds it back? How can we help this to improve our economic competitiveness, not be a barrier to it? So how can we ensure that we're not just giving handouts and subsidies to old industries like steel and so on uh, to, keep, to help them through this process, but actually use innovative technologies like the ones I've described and others to put them on a more sustainable footing and use taxpayers' money wisely? How can we do the same for the public to help energy efficiency, particularly in people's homes, and what more can we do there? And I suppose lastly, how can we be consumer focused? And my uh, approach to this, and I think it's the same it's for the Chancellor, is how can we try to avoid interventionist policies, but actually use free market policies to help people to adopt these new technologies, to drive investment, the private sector, to invent our way to that decarbonized future. Um, and if wherever possible, avoid intervening in markets unnecessarily and wasting taxpayers' money. Uh, but I'm very interested to hear your views today. Uh, we are very keen to make this a significant part of the budget in four weeks' time. So I'll treat, as the Chancellor would say, your questions as budget submissions. Uh, but thank you very much for having us here today. And thank you to Josh and Policy Exchange for hosting me. Thank you, Rob. Given I know that I should make a quick housekeeping point. Rob has to leave um, halfway through. So with that in mind, is there any quick uh, sneak previews you can give us of the, of the budget? <laughs> <laughs> um, any annou new announcements on no. uh, well, the clean growth revolution? I, I, there's not much I can tell you at this point. There are some things we're really interested in, though, which would be good to hear uh, views either now or in the coming weeks, um, some of which I've already spoken to you about, like energy efficiency, for example. What further good value for money interventions the government can do on R&D and some of those technologies like electric vehicles, for example. Um, and also, what can the city do? You know, we're really engaged at the Treasury in the idea of green finance, whether the, we can do green bonds, what, what we can do to help the city to drive this forward and you know, increase our international profile and stature as a leader in this field. Um, and I suppose a bit of a tangent, we are really engaged in the topic of plastics and we'd like to see some, as I suppose we've already shown quite a lot of leg on this, we'd like to use the budget to make a really systemic generational intervention on the use of plastics and increasing recycling, which we know we can do and Conservatives have done before. So if you think of a chance like Ken Clark, who created the landfill tax back in the 90s, that ended up making a huge difference to the way we treat waste and increasing recycling across the country. And we think we have the policies that could make a similar effect on plastics 
uh, and that, so that will undoubtedly be a feature of the budget. Thank you. And does that look anything like a deposit return scheme? Well, we're already, we've already announced we're going to consult on the deposit return Indeed. scheme, so that work is underway. This is, this is in addition to that. Thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to Tom now. Okay, great. So, you, Robert, thank you. You've, you've finally answered my question as why Germans get so many holidays, <laughs> um, which is always a bit of a bugbear for me when I get half, half of my, my, my fellow board members in Germany, but that's supposed to be more productive. Um, I mean, we're going to talk about the future of decarbonisation, but before we probably do that, we should reflect on the, achie the massive achievements the power sector in the UK has already done. So in the last 10 years, we've halved our carbon emissions. So, that's a, uh, so, so basically, we know we can do it, and we can do it again. So meeting the targets once they're set, I think the industry, the power industry, has proven it can do that. And that is very encouraging when we talk about low-carbon electricity, which is required in order that also transport and heat can also meet its decarbonisation goals. Um, and the clean growth strategy um, set out the challenge. So 85% of electricity from low carbon sources by 2032. I think Labour uh, set down an even uh, more ambitious, uh, I won't say a target, uh, aspiration, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and so we know what the challenge is there and the clearer policy framework that we have the more likely we're going to deliver it. Um, I think we talked about the, the, the purpose is to talk about what technologies will, will achieve that. I think from an RDB perspective, as an operator of almost all technologies uh, you can think of in this sector, you know, we believe that all technologies will play a role and there won't be a silver bullet that will enable us to have one technology. When you look forward, though, if you look at the Climate Committee, sorry, the Committee on Climate Change and look on their all their forecasts, it's clear that wind and solar will be the main uh, technologies that are bearing the kind of the, 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 the real reductions from the industry. And um, offshore in particular, and the, the UK should be very proud of its leading role in offshore. Um, mm. uh, RWE believes in, in that industry, so uh, assuming that our planned uh, acquisition of the Energy and Eon portfolio goes ahead, will become the second largest offshore player in the world. A lot of that coming from UK expertise. Um, and the, the pipeline of auctions that Claire Perry mm -hmm. set forward, um, you know, will help us meet the 30 gigawatt ambition by 2032. Um, it will give us a boost to UK manufacturing mm -hmm. and local commitment with 49% coming of a project spend coming from the UK. So that's great. I think where you're missing a trick may be mm. you asked about where you get value for money as mm -hmm. the uh, Treasury, and that's in relation to onshore wind. Mm. So onshore wind is clearly the cheapest uh, renewable technology, and yet mm. it currently doesn't have a route to market. Um, we know that the Conservative Party sometimes struggles with some of the local consents, but you've already put forward legislation to make sure they can only go ahead when locally supported. And, and now we really need that support um, of future auctions so that we can get that pipeline uh, going. Um, a recent study um, by BVG, just to give you some economics to go with it, found that if we had five gigawatts of onshore, it would bring 12 billion of benefit to the UK economy. So uh, I think there's a really good case to go with that. And if you're committed to reducing the cost of energy as well as decarbonising, then a clear timetable for auctions for onshore would be a, a key request for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of the coin, as, as we look at it as RWE, is how do you integrate this variable energy into the system and firm flexible capacity at all levels? I mean, people talk about decentral or central. I mean, actually, it, it, that's just where you connect on the grid. And in some circumstances, it makes sense to have it close to your home, close to the demand. In other circumstances, it makes sense to have it at high voltage. There is an engineering reason why transporting at high voltage makes sense. So you need a mixture. Um, you know, the, the big challenge there, because we talk about batteries, but batteries is really good for kind of short-term response. It's very, very expensive for longer-term response and we are losing a lot of our inherent energy storage through the closure of coal plants because you used to have at one point we had a year's worth of coal on our coal stations yes that's an immense amount of energy storage and i couldn't tell you how many tens of billions it would cost to have that in batteries mm -hmm. so that 
the problem you've got is there's going to be days in the f in the future where the wind doesn't blow, mm. yeah, and we need something to fill that kind of medium term uh, storage, and that's actually the bigger challenge for the uh, energy system. And we all are investing in all kinds of technologies to try and look at this from. You know, longer term batteries like redox flow, aluminium to air batteries, hydrogen storage. We're all looking at it. Nobody's found the economic solution yet, apart from, to be honest, putting on a gas station. Yeah, that is the only economic solution. So, so we're working on it. We're committed to spending at least 1.5 billion euros a year on renewables, at least. Um, uh, but even with that commitment, we will continue investing in firm, flexible capacity. And we do that because there's a sensible framework like the capacity market that enables us to do that. And so we would also say as a kind of a policy thing, keep on going with the capacity market. And then the only final bit, my wish for your budget, because mm. you said we should ask, is please can we have some certainty on carbon pricing in the UK? So we really don't know post-March what the carbon price is in the UK. You've indicated it. You know, we're making 10, 15, 20-year decisions and if you want to support renewables and you want to have a low cost to consumer, it's really important that you give us a clear signal on where you're going with carbon pricing. So okay. that's my, my summary. The power sector can do it. We've got a track record of doing it and the path is clear with mm -hmm. your growth strategy. Mm -hmm. Support onshore, it will be the cheapest form of renewables and give us a clear framework with a capacity market and a carbon price. And we'll be very happy and as a power sector, we will deliver it. Thank you very much. Um, so let's hear more now from uh, Nissan about what can be done in the automotive sector. Friedrich. Thank you and good afternoon. I mean, it's quite exciting uh, to be as an automotive company at an energy event. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't have imagined this could happen or what are all the links uh, to it. So I'm very grateful for the invitation and for having uh, uh, um, um, Policy Exchange and uh, um, uh, UK Energy, Energy UK uh, hosting the event because there are huge opportunities. We all know we speak about huge challenges, first of all. Um, uh, we all know we need to meet the climate uh, uh, change uh, targets of the Paris Agreement of COP21. And we all know we need to do that collectively in order to achieve that. Uh, there is no way around it, and we need to act now. Most importantly, we need to act now in order to capture the opportunities rather than uh, having the risk in front of us. Now, Nissan is totally passionate about electric vehicles. Um, we do believe that is a, a solution to address the challenges ahead of us, um, but also that this solution is a solution that is available today. And on top of that, if smartly connected to the grid, to the buildings, to the homes, it can help transitioning the energy to renewable energies. And the potential is huge. I'll come to that in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but what, what, what we are saying about the UK, the UK, I would say, is leading in Europe the way towards these uh, directions. They have done a lot of work on it, uh, going into <coughs> the right directions with the zero emission, um, uh, road to zero strategy, with the task force they have put in place, with the electric vehicle and autonomous drive act. But we still see siloed approach from the energy sector to the automotive sector. And we need to bring this together in order to capture the full potential of that. Um, that's why I'm quite happy to be here, to sit here and to discuss the opportunities. Um, in particular with Energy UK having done a lot of work preparing the grid for the electric vehicles, but also with RWE, uh, with whom we're, we're doing a couple of projects in order to see how we can make good offers in terms of charging and electricity uh, supply to our EV customers. But I wanted to share with you, because I'm not quite sure this is so known in the audience of the, of the potential of EVs, a little bit of our views on this topic from a Nissan perspective. Um, we have invested long time ago four billion in electric vehicles. That was at a time no one believed in this technology, no one. There were no belief in the market adoption to electric uh, vehicles. We all know today this has changed. You do see other OEMs coming into the game offering um, the cars. Now, 
um, are a leaf who's produced in the UK now with 100,000 units at, in, at our Sunderland plant, um, is one of the best selling EVs. We have now sold 350,000 of the leaf. In total, in our alliance with Renault, we have sold 640,000 electric cars. This is by far the, the biggest number in the automotive industry. Now, it's not just about sales, it's about experience, about the battery technology. Um, how customers are using the battery, how they are driving, what can you do beyond the, uh, the battery. This is nearly now, we've launched the LEAF in 2010, now nearly a decade we have that experience in battery technology. Now, it's obvious that we don't only look into uh, the EV as a car, but we look beyond the car. With looking into the biggest asset this car has, which is the battery. Now, with smart technology like vehicle to grid, what that potential could be for the energy sector. Now, with the challenges we need to transform into renewable energies, we just heard about the, the, the storage needs <coughs> for renewable energies. Imagine what uh, a battery at scale in a car can do. And now to give you a couple of examples what kind of projects we are looking into at the moment. First of all, think about the homes as powerhouses. What do you do with the batteries once they have passed their first life in a car? So we have explored a couple of, um, extor call it X storage uh, things, where we put batteries in homes so that they can capture the uh, solar energy uh, in their homes in order to use the energy uh, while the sun is not shining um, and, and to potentially also give it back to the grid. I'll come back to the point. To give you another example, in the Amsterdam Arena, some of you may have been there for a big concert, is now supplied uh, with 148 battery packs of Nissan in order to, to serve as a backup solution if there is a, a, a power shutdown during a concert or, or uh, something like that. But, but also, to capture the solar energy they have put on the roof and to, uh, uh, to, to give energy back to the grid at times of uh, peaks and to get the energy uh, uh, at times of uh, uh, low uh, energy demand. Now I come back to the vehicle to grid solutions because here it really becomes very exciting actually. Um, actually you speak about the cars as mobile power units. So if you use the, the vehicle to grid technology you can with a smart uh, system you can uh, use the car as uh, uh, taking energy at low, uh, low peak uh, at low uh, what's the word at low uh, low demand uh, times and give it back at peak times. Just to give you a size, sorry, I've only the numbers of uh, France, um, um, but I assume it's, it's similar in, in the UK. Um, with the target of EVs of, uh, I think we speak in, in France about uh, 40, no, is it, let me check that, 45 million EVs, no, it can't be true, 45 million EVs on the road. That gives you 4.5 gigawatt hours uh, 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 power. That is or four point, no, it gives you 40, uh, 45 gigawatts powers. That is 4.5 giga, gigawatt powers is the demand you have between six o'clock and eight o'clock at winter times. So it's just 10%. So the size of the EVs on the road uh, is, is uh, giving you, um, is, is feeding 10% of the demand in peak hours. Now, this is an opportunity where we need to work collaboratively together and think about the, the, the offers we can uh, uh, give to the market. Because if you think about fleet operators of EVs, they could potentially see that as a revenue stream. So we have a couple of projects with over in the UK to supply um, 1,000 charging uh, stations for fleet operators, but also for residentials to explore the opportunity 
what is the revenue a fleet operator can make and to give it back. So the key fundamental thing for us is we can't approach the things anymore in silos. We need to work collaboratively together in order to think how we can integrate electric vehicles into the broader sustainability uh, topics, including energy, to help the transition to, to happen far quicker than we may imagine today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you mentioned the importance of moving away from a siloed approach. How can we, how can we get there? How can we great, get greater integration of the auto sector and, and the energy sector? And what, what would you like to see from government? What would you like to see from your other colleagues in, the, in this sector? What would be your ask? First of all, I mean, we can't c keep on addressing the topics department by department. We need to break the things, need to bring them together and think about solution um, that is beyond the, the, the pure department, uh, transport or uh, uh, business, etc. That needs to cross because the, the, the industries are, as I said, a couple of years ago, so you couldn't imagine an automotive um, um, a company would sit at this this uh, event. Now, governments know, also need to think about how to break the silos in, in departments, how to think about the solutions, because it's to, to think about where do I need to support and incentivize an uptake of EV investments. At the same time, it may, to understand what could be also a business, um, how to say, there are potentials for making revenues. Yeah. And that is, I think, a fundamental uh, uh, thing to, under to, to understand. It's not about governments giving money uh, to things. There is an opportunity to have business self-developing the things and generating um, money through this project. But you just need to remove the burdens you need to incentivize uh, going into this area. And for EVs, unfortunately, I must say, costs are still high. Battery costs are very, very expensive. And the uptake, we see an uptake now, but in order to capture the full potential of the thing, it still needs uh, uh, to, to, to get the right support from government, not only on the cash incentives, but um, the infrastructure is hugely important. Um, and, and to give also confidence to consumers, they can start uh, uh, in investing in that and also have it smartly invested. So bi-directional charging is one of the fundamental things to, in order to capture the full potential. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lawrence. Yeah. I think, I, I hope one of the things that, that's come across to people is that, number one, uh, the transition we're in in terms of moving to a, a, a clean economy is, is well underway. And number two, it's actually really exciting. And picking up on, on Rob's piece earlier about how clean energy drives the economy, the opportunities for UK industry here are absolutely vast in terms of what we can do and what we can deliver. And I think, as, as Tom said, the, the industry is already doing this. Just take the power sector and the fact that we've already hit 50% uh, decarbonisation levels. But that doesn't move away from the fact that we've still got a tremendous amount to do. We've still got to do the other half of power generation in a way that, that maintains security of supply. But we've also got to look um, at transport, how we really decarbonise that. But almost more importantly, we've got to do something with heat and how we decarbonise heat. And that is actually central to modern society. And how do we ensure that some of the worst off in society, so the fuel poor, actually can benefit from a modern standard of heat in their homes? And I think, you know, going back to, to budget talk, etc., I think it's well worth looking right the way across government and removing those silos because there is a direct link between the health of an individual and cost to the NHS. And the more you can make those links and establish that, actually the stronger the story gets for investing in energy efficiency across the nation at a domestic level. We've still got millions of houses to do to actually start improving this. So that's, that's a real area. And again, it comes down to that old phrase, the cheapest power is the power you don't use. It's a truism. So yeah, there's, there's still a lot to do, but it's all really exciting because it can really make significant differences to people's lives. And actually, it's all really exportable. Um, Picking up on um, Tom's point around carbon pricing, 
one of the successes of the UK is we've got a really strong carbon price and it's provided the incentives to decarbonise our economy and to drive generation in clean technology. So we absolutely need that confirmation on where carbon price is going. It's worthwhile noting as well that the current price of the EU ETS is north of 20, pounds, 20 euros a, a tonne of carbon. Most of that is because of the significant amount of work that the UK government put into reforming the EU ETS to actually ensure that the carbon price went up uh, in partnership with, uh, with the carbon price support. So, and I think the Minister might have said something along the lines of uh, the EU ETS is favoured in, uh, in comments he made this Indeed. morning, but maybe we could confirm that, Rob, with you later. <laughs> um, don't want to put words into your mouth at this juncture. Um, but I think we also need to look at um, how we're structuring the bill. So moving into clean growth is great, but we also need to make sure that we're recognising who's paying for it, and ultimately the consumer's paying for it. Now, whether that's a domestic consumer or whether it's a business consumer or an industrial consumer, they're the ones who are paying for the bill and paying for all of the investments. So we need to make sure that we're structuring that payment in the most equitable fashion because at the moment the electricity bill is probably one of the regressive, most regressive forms of taxation you can possibly come across with some of the poorest in society paying for some of the wealthiest in society to get uh, policy benefits directly. So we mustn't take our, our notice uh, away from that. Um, I think there are also a lot of unanswered questions. I think Tom said there's no silver bullet, and I think across a whole range of areas, um, transport saturation probably the clearest in terms of batteries, but certainly with regard to heat and, and power, there's not one silver bullet. So a whole range of different uh, technologies are going to be required. We're also going to need to understand how we charge for our network access how we actually manage the different styles of technology we have on the system, how we support the fact that we will still have very large uh, centralised power systems on the grid as well as decentralised power off the grid. So we've got to get the balancing right between these different technologies and how we, we pay for that. And that's why we started um, a programme of work earlier on this year, the Future of Energy, which is looking at all of these different <coughs> elements and ultimately how they fit together and what the policy outcomes that, that we would be needed to uh, to deliver some of those things and we'll be working with the industry and with government over the next year to to start delivering some of those things but I think to to sum up it's a case of this is happening now it's happening in front of our eyes it's something that everybody in this room can essentially get involved in um, every form of generation I think has a role in the future market um, as we drive towards decarbonisation. I completely agree that we need to be looking at how we handle elements like onshore wind. We need to make sure that there's effective uh, routes to market for all generation. And we need to accept the fact that as we progress, as we transition, we will have a significant mix of generation on the system. That's part of, uh, of the process we're looking at today. But equally, we need to understand what those drivers are and the fact that to deliver the investment we need to and we're still talking many 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 billions of pounds whether it's the infrastructure work that uh, Frederica referred to around uh, charging points and how we structure that whether it's really working towards a smart grid which lots of us have heard conversations about for many years but we've actually got to deliver it so that you're dealing with uh, generation in front of and behind the meter and how you work with that as a mix of technologies going into the system the vehicle to grid uh, could be a massive point of that we have something like uh, 850,000 solar installations uh, on the on the energy system at the moment something like 13 gigawatts of solar Imagine if you combine that with all of the established plant, the biomass plants, the gas plants, the nuclear fleet, etc. What a difference that would make. And then if you add on several million EVs into that. Yeah, this is going to be a radically different system that we're going to be sitting here talking about in 15 years' time, in five years' time, in 10 years' time. So I think you know, we need to grasp this as a country. We've got tremendous opportunities. I honestly believe it's really exciting, and yeah, let's embrace it and move forward. Thank you, Lawrence. Rob, I'm going to go to you for your final thoughts before you have to 
Please. What about James? Well, just before we get to James, in case you have in case I've uh, just been writing out my you... shopping list for the budget, and if it's <laughs> before I've delivered it, well, I'll be annoyed, John. It was only in case you had to leave. In, in, oh, no, I have a few more minutes. Okay. Oh, just on the, the one point you did raise about um, ETS, I mean, I think I said, I said to those of you who were present this morning, but there are, I mean, there are really three, three principal options that are available to us. Remain within ETS create a highly aligned system linked to ETS, or create our own, sorry, those of you who don't, are not familiar with this, um, or create our own UK carbon tax. And so each of those is under consideration. It seems unlikely that we'll be able to remain within ETS, but that's still um, a subject of negotiation. Either of the other two options are similar in the sense that we would be highly aligned to mm. ETS, um, but one would mean that it, we would be able to trade within ETS and the other mm. wouldn't. And there are pros and cons to each, because one would enable, if we remain highly aligned to ETS, then to some extent we're a rule taker and we need to consider as a country what the negative consequence of that would be or could be in the future. Um, if we create our own carbon tax, then there is some sense that, that we could flex, if only modestly, when we need to as a country. Um, but at the moment, our strong preference is to be outside of the ETS if it's that if that option isn't possible, um, but highly aligned to it. I mean, I think there's there's two points though. There's the the technical bit, which for all the policy wonks we're all really interested in, but there's also the absolute level. Yeah. So currently, the implicit carbon price total in the UK is thirty eight pounds a ton. Mm. Yeah, and in Europe, it's twenty one maybe today or twenty two. It's so volatile at the moment, mm. hard to mm. keep track. Um, because of the add-on carbon tax, and you've mm. also indicated you're targeting a total carbon price of 23. So there's a mm. £15 a tonne of uncertainty, and that £15 a tonne of uncertainty could deliver you onshore wind or not. Mm. Mm. Yeah? Understood. Okay. So, so the, yeah. there's a technical point, which is yeah. uh, really detailed, but there's also what level are you really targeting? Mm. Okay. I might be pushing my luck here, but if you had a state of preference for a domestic trading scheme or an independent carbon tax... Which would it be? Oh, I think I'll get into trouble with Philip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I'd ask. Uh, but we may... I mean, the budget is now going to fall before we know the final outcome of the negotiation. So it may be that we don't, uh, we don't have the opportunity to, to clarify this at budget, but it, if not, then shortly thereafter. Thank you. James. Thank you. Uh, I was very encouraged by Rob's uh, that he was going to take all of this as a budget submission. So, uh, <laughs> not from you, uh, James. I, 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 I've abandoned my sort of usual stump speech about sort of flexibility and everything else in favour of, uh, of, of a shopping list. Um, uh, so, firstly, I, I wonder whether we should um, think again on fracking. I think that it, it, the success that the lever that the Chancellor pulled last year to allow late life exploitation in the North Sea might encourage us that that is a way of maintaining revenues for oil and gas without paying the political price of fracking. And I think there's a growing number of us on the back benches that are, that are voicing that. Um, I agree very much on the need to price carbon and then let the market react. I, I've heard a number of senior businessmen, FTSE 100 chief execs, have said, look, you know, if you want to know how to decarbonise the economy at best speed, price carbon and then get out the way and we, mm -hmm. it will react. Mm -hmm. um, and then CCS, which I think, you know, George Osborne was right to drop off the agenda uh, a couple of years ago. It was too expensive in itself, but if seen as part of a wider transition to hydrogen and <clears throat> the opportunities that that brings, I think there's an opportunity there that could be quite exciting. On generation, I think we've got to rehabilitate onshore wind. Um, forgive me for using a very crude sort of um, metaphor from my former life as a soldier, but, but we double-tapped onshore wind. We shot it twice. We took away the subsidy and we strengthened the planning constraints, uh, the, the, the planning system. I think that you know, if we've strengthened the planning system and we've done it properly so that onshore wind cannot be built without local consent, then there's nothing to fear from running pot one auctions in which onshore wind might be able to come forward because undeniably it is the cheapest form of generation. So too do we need to be clear what we want from solar. Um, we're looking again at the feed-in tariffs and, and I think that's right. I, you know, I think that big, big, big commercial scale solar is pretty much ready to stand on its own two feet. I think that there's a, there's a part of the solar market in the middle, particularly around community energy schemes, that I think we should be concerned about. But at the domestic level, we need to move people away from thinking about putting solar on their roof 
and getting a feed-in tariff to what Nissan are so brilliantly doing and offering sort of solar plus storage and charge points within the home. So you install solar not as a mechanism for making money because you're putting it into the system, but as a way of balancing your own energy needs to make your living costs uh, more cheap. And I think we should be sort of clear on how government wants to support solar to make that the reality. On flexibility and efficiency, um, I think we've got to revisit EPCs. They're, they're, they're out of date. A lot's changed in the energy efficiency uh, world since we sort of first, since they were last looked at. And one of the biggest things that I would like to see is that clean tech is reflected in EPC gradings. Um, I think that that would um, really catalyze the clean tech, the domestic clean tech market, uh, and that would be a good lever to pull. Um, I also think that as we come to the end of the first lap on smart meters, when we've asked everybody very nicely, it might be time to get out a bit of a stick and say that on the second lap, you can no longer have a band C, EPC or higher without a smart meter in your home. And I think that would, that would sort of catalyze um, the, the deployment of those. I also think that from you know, eco is a great thing. Uh, and getting clean tech into the eco catalogue so that actually it's not just insulation in the lofts, better windows, better doors, but also you know, smart thermostats and things like that going into the home as part of the eco program would be a great thing to do. Um, let's Abandoning the Green Deal made a lot of sense, but it also has completely stopped the in the able to pay market the ability to deploy those technologies. I'm going through a, a renovation at the moment, and it is prohibitive to do everything. I sit here talking about all this stuff all the time, and yet I'm not even close to being able to afford an air pump with all the insulation that I would need in order to make an air pump viable. Uh, and uh, yes, I get a lot of that back in the RHI over the seven years that follow, but is it, not, is it beyond the wit of man to have a financing program against your RHI that helps you with that um, upfront cost that is that is so prohibitive. Um, again, with, 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 with the winter fuel payment, we're spewing money out all over the place, and we're actually just paying people to burn fuel, irrespective of how efficient their house is. And it seems, compared to, in, in all other areas, the Treasury is driving down on, on where public money is being spent inefficiently. And yet every winter, we just hand over checks to people, irrespective of how efficiently they're spending that money thereafter. And so I wonder whether there's some way of converting this payment into, a, into energy efficiency vouchers. Oh, which, by the way, has the impact of upgrading the housing stock. So as that goes off in system, there's a legacy of that winter fuel payment beyond it simply going into the profits uh, of, of the energy companies. Sorry, Lawrence. Um, the, uh, I completely agree with you, so <laughs> it's fine. Um, let, let, and, and this is a massive one for MHCLG. It's been so frustrating for the last few years that we've got this very, very worthwhile policy, keystone policy of building houses to make housing more affordable. But our definition of affordability is exclusively about what it costs to buy or rent a house. We don't seem to worry about the fact that if you buy or rent a house that's really inefficient to live in, you might save 50 quid on your rent or your mortgage in the month, but you might spend an extra 100 quid on your energy bills. So let's get that definition of affordability right. Stand up to the house builders and say to them, you know, you've got to build better because it's not just about the price at which it's sold. It's about the money it then spent, your money it then you then have to pay each month to live in thereafter. Um, let's do DSR. I know everybody says it might not work, but it might. Uh, so let's unlock that flexibility because I think that the uh, the technology is there and we've got the opportunity to be one of the leaders in the world in doing that and that's a massive export opportunity for us. Um, and let's look at how we can incentivize industry to do more with their waste heat. Some are already enlightened and you might argue that it's for financial directors and CFOs to make that realization and, and realize a sort of uh, a gain in profits on the back of it. But I think that there is a, um, that maybe government has got a role to play in, in catalyzing that change because that could do an awful lot in terms of providing heat more cheaply um, whilst helping energy with uh, industry with its energy costs. Um, I also think, and this is slightly controversial, I know, Rob, that Treasury is awkward about it, but at some point, pump revenues are going to start to decline because the brilliant cars made by Nissan and others are just going to become irresistible to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And I, I worry that 
if we leave it for another 10 years or so to work out how we're going to price electrified motoring, the consumer will feel pretty hard done by that they've gone across to, to EVs and then they'll feel like the government is spotting a good thing and rowing into tax them. <clears throat> if we signpost now how we're going to tax electrified motoring and compensate for that loss in pump revenues, I think that that would be a much fairer way of, of leading people across to EVs. Um, the final few on the system, we've got to put our foots firmly on the throats of the DNOs and make them accelerate their, trans, um, their transformation into DSOs. Uh, the, the, the analogy I think of is, you know, perhaps we didn't push BT Openreach hard enough early enough over fibre and then it became a big public policy and public money issue to catch up with where we could have been if we'd spotted early enough that the system needed to develop. And I think that if we can, if we can push the DNOs harder to become DSOs, then we will avoid um, a, a, a policy and, and tax costs later on. Um, let's have a really, really good look at hydrogen. I think that that has got a huge role to play, both in terms of facilitating low carbon heavy industry and low carbon heat. And then let's finally um, get uh, DEXU to be clear on what our future is within the energy union so that interconnection can continue at pace with all of the advantages that brings. Brilliant. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> a, short, a short shopping list uh, from you, James. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to go straight to questions from the floor. If I could ask for your name and organisation, uh, that would be great. Uh, Doug, and then the gentleman in, in the glasses there, please. Uh, hi, it's Doug Parr from Greenpeace. Thanks for that. It was a fantastic set of uh, fantastic set of present. Uh, and of course, I have my points to make. And, and fortunately, James has made loads of them for me. So, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's Doug. Just, I'm sorry. But I would highlight. So, because Robert started off, we, where are we going to get? Where are we going to get some? You know, the confluence between growth and low carbon. And of course, we, we're heading for a zero carbon world. I mean, that is that is soon going to be the aspiration of government. We're already seeing other nations doing it now. In that context, I look at buildings. And the first, first step, of course, is to go for a, something like a zero carbon standard, not just in homes, but actually in commercial buildings. Why? Because in the London 2012 Olympics, we made a big thing about embedded carbon in what was constructed on that site. We were leading the world at that point, and yet, you know, it's kind of dissipated. Yet we also have some of the best architects in the world. You know, we've got the builders as well with Arup. We've got the, the, the sort of nameplate architects like Richard Rogers. We're going to need low carbon cement and steel that no other country is doing. There is a confluence of stuff there where Britain could become a world leader like they currently are on offshore wind, where other countries are trying to copy us. We've got the, the germ of something there, but it starts with standards in buildings in the UK that could be a platform for something really, really special and important globally. Thank you. Does anyone want to tackle that first? <laughs> well, hard to disagree yes, with. Hard to disagree. hard to disagree with. Well, I would just say one thing that we are. What, what the one area we do control is public procurement and the buildings that we build ourselves or we pay the money to build. And there we're very interested in energy efficiency and in modern methods of construction. And so we set a presumption this time last year in the budget that any public building, so schools, hospitals, government buildings, etc., that they would have to be built. Or, or at least one would have to explore the possibility of building them through what we call modern methods of construction. And that doesn't just mean uh, modular, for example, which is one of the, you know, the, what, what most people took it to mean, um, but it also means proper taking new innovative steps towards energy efficiency. Um, and that's a theme we'd like to continue and see if we can, there's more levers we can push in the public sector to lead the way. Um, and next year we'll have our spending review when we'll be doling out the budgets for departments that do build, like hospitals, schools, the Ministry of Defence, um, and that could be one of the themes of it, that we, where new buildings and capital spend is done, it's done in modern ways, which helps to stimulate an industry for energy efficiency, modular, better you know, digital construction and so on. Thank you. Lawrence? Yeah, just, just very quickly, actually, I think... Um, yeah, yeah. There's, there's an element here that the energy company of the future uh, will need to work in partnership with its customer. So 
if, if I'm serving uh, an industrial and commercial customer, if I'm serving a business to business or, or even a domestic customer, the more I can work in partnership with that customer to sort of manage how they're using their energy, to manage how they're, they're working responsibly, actually the better my relationship will be with my customers because I can build up that working relationship and I think there's a huge incentive to do exactly what, what we've just been discussing but do it via partnership and it's this changing relationship that picks up on James's point around on sort of where profits are coming from in the future that actually as an energy company by investing in this by investing in your customers you're building loyalty and you're actually building opportunities to work together to, to grow the economy of the future. So I think that's something that we really need to look at because, again, it's that changing relationship between customers and an energy company of the future that is going to be at the heart of this. Thank you. Mm. The gentleman there in the glasses. Thank you. I want to first of all say thank you to Nissan because we now own or our second generation LEAF and it's a fantastic car to drive. And what I would suggest to you, anybody who's interested, ask for a test drive, even if you don't buy one. It's worth it. <laughs> that said, it has its limitations, namely range and the speed at which it takes to refill it. So one of the things that I'm concerned about is this document here doesn't mention hydrogen-powered cars. And as far as I know, Nissan doesn't offer hydrogen-powered cars in this country, which is a pity, because if you look at... Uh, the sales of EVs, um, I believe in this country, they are plateauing. And the reason I think they're plateauing is because they're not practical. I mean, my wife mainly uses our EV to do local runs to visit the family. But we have a petrol engine gas guzzler for doing the long distances. What we need is a vehicle which has the same speed of refill and the same range as a petrol diesel engine. And the answer is a hydrogen-powered car. If you go to Germany, you've got over 50 hydrogen filling stations around the German road network. Now, the problem here, and this is really uh, towards uh, Robert, um, the Treasury is currently putting in, I believe, 10 times as much support money into uh, building up the infrastructure for electric charging points compared with the rollout of hydrogen power sta filling stations in this country. They are coming. It's incredibly slow. Mm. Can I push you for a question, if there is one? So my question is, Thank you. would you like to please Treasury change that <laughs> for <laughs> the development of the hydrogen filling station infrastructure? Thank maybe, you. maybe I make a comment yeah, on of course. RW's view of hydrogen. So um, our view is, it's, it's, the problem is, is, is how expensive it is to produce. So yeah, um, if you want to do it by electrolysis, you need to have very cheap electricity and, there, and if you're putting the massive capital expense in for, for the electrolyte, then effectively you need a very, low, a very large load factor. And actually, there's not that many periods where the wind will blow so much that we'll get free electricity, etc. The other one is stem, uh, steam reformation with carbon capture and storage. And carbon capture and storage is also not economic yet. So the problem is, is it, you've got to go back to the point of where your hydrogen is coming from. And can you produce it cheaply, low carbon? And then you've got to look at the, the, the other sources of hydrogen, uh, so the uses of hydrogen. And we see um, hydrogen has got a big role, but for industrial processes. And the value an industrial will pay for hydrogen will be higher than a car owner will be able to afford. So that's the reason why we don't believe in a hydrogen for cars. Uh, maybe Nissan wants to talk about from a car owner perspective. Yeah, we've looked at the economics of it, yeah. Yeah, so... so yeah. You know, so I'm uh, actually head of commercial for Germany as well and business development, <laughs> and we've looked at it, and that's our European view. That's where you need a handheld. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I could add on this one, there is no technology um, we are excluding. Yeah? So as a, as a company, we should never stop in looking into uh, potential opportunities in the technologies. The battery technology took us, it's not that we started yesterday on, on, on this topic, uh, so I wouldn't, I, I agree with you, it shouldn't be exclusive no, that, we, that we say this is the only technology that is going to, to, to save our planet or to address the challenges we're having. But the fundamental thing, this is at the moment the solution of today. 
and for the years to come, understand the constraints on the range. Um, uh, and it took us nearly a decade, uh, it, and it's a two challenge. You need to bring the cost of the batteries down because we believe we need to offer a product to the consumer that is affordable. We wouldn't offer anything, and that's also why, that is not affordable or goes into a premium uh, sector where only the upper class can afford having a clean car. So it needs to be affordable. At the same time, we need to continue to invest to ex uh, um, extend the range. Now, the new leave already extended the range, understand the constraints, but it's actually addressing 95 percent of the, the people's daily driving behavior we shouldn't ignore that yes there is a remaining portion of five percent and we need to think about how to solve that how to reduce uh, charging times how to embed that in their daily life if i'm auto driving a leaf i'm using it like a mobile phone whenever i have the opportunity i plug it in and i never came into the situation yes you'd like to do some longer drive distance and then you potentially face the topic but it's the speed of technology and development is going fast we, we we are about some time to be announced soon the next generation with the and and then we won't speak anymore about real driving issues so i just wanted to confirm yes we shouldn't stand still we need to com continue to invest in technologies but there are solutions today and we we need to address a couple of challenges today. Thank you. Got time for two more questions. So I'll take the lady at the front um, and the gentleman. I've neglected the left, so I'll take you over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Rudge from the Sustainable Energy Association. Um, well, first of all, thanks to James for coming up with a great list of um, policies. And um, I'll type because, them up. Question <laughs> to, um, I've already, have already written them actually. So. Um, a question to, um, I suppose one thing is to Robert is to, um, you know, please, can you commit to taking away and looking at some of these things? But I think the, the other thing is it's, it's good to see people from Nissan on the panel, people from Treasury, as well as people like James, who are you know, constantly going to these things and mm. seeing the, the right things. Um, we also perhaps need people from health, um, because you know, as we've said about the benefits of things like energy efficiency and, and various other departments. Um, there was a bit of a U-turn recently on sort of um, eco being, oil boilers being supported in the eco scheme. And um, so the government proposed that we're gonna stop that and then they changed. I would just like to ask, you know, can we actually agree that to deliver the clean growth strategy, there are gonna be some tough decisions. There will be some unpopular decisions. And one of the things James mentioned was the winter fuel payment. She's mm. clearly not very well targeted. And the things that James mentioned, really good ideas as to how we could use that. But that's a tough political decision. Um, probably, you know, it might not be seen as a vote winner, but I think you're going to have to do some tough decisions if you genuinely are going to achieve these targets. So I guess my question is, could Treasury support things like that and actually start taking some decisions, <laughs> tough or otherwise? Thank you. I'll take the question there, and then we'll do the bit together. Uh, There's a mic coming, don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. Name and organisation. Hi. Uh, Tom Williamson from Scottish Power. Uh, just mm. a one sentence question uh, for Robert. Following Tom's <laughs> uh, comments on onshore wind, mm. could you set out the Treasury position, please? Thank you. Mm. Two for you. Okay. Well, in terms of, shall we take some difficult decisions? Well, that's what the Treasury is there for. It's the Guardian taxpayers' money. We're, we're there to stop schemes that bad value for money and try and make the best decisions for the country. Um, winter fuel payments were a manifesto commitment by the Conservative Party, so I think it's unlikely that we're going to change that. They're also a manifesto commitment by the DUP. Um, and uh, so I think it's very unlikely that we would tackle that. There is a, the, the people have come to us with proposals on how you could use the money uh, more effectively. And, you know, for example, whether you can give them in the form of vouchers for uh, energy efficiency, that's not one that I've heard before. We have had people who've spoken to us about whether you could help people to take multiple years worth at any one time and use that to do something meaningful in their homes rather than simply helping them with their bills year on, year out, whether you could take three, four, five years at once and use that chunk of money to do something that would make a real difference to their lives in the future. Um, these are quite technically difficult things to do to work out the mechanism how you do them, but they're, we're, we're sort of open to, to conversations like that. But there's no proposal to end the winter fuel payment um, at the moment. Um, the, there's a few of the other things that were raised in the James Heapy manifesto. Um, 
the uh, eco and smart thermostats and so on. Well, the, the, I think it is being consulted on at the moment, it what is, the future is. And we did have a debate within government about the degree to which we would permit innovation and sort of innovative technologies to be part of that. And in the end, um, I think erred on the side of innovation. And so the, the consultation does discuss what proportion of eco could be given to new technologies rather than those that are tried and tested. Obviously, you've got if we're putting significant amounts of taxpayers' money against this, we want to ensure that's being spent wisely and achieving value for money. But we have set up the consultation so that potentially quite a large amount could go to those more innovative technologies that may well you know, drive things forward in the future and be good value for money in the long term. Um, in terms of smart energy systems in homes, well, this was one of the reasons why uh, we took the decision to... Uh, move our energies away from superfast broadband and now onto full fibre because we felt that it was absolutely essential that all parts of the country got full fibre so that we could start you know, in the long term to get the full benefits of um, smart energy systems and smart homes. And we've chosen through the um, fibre, the infrastructure review that we've done with DCMS, to take uh, the approach that whilst we see the vast majority of the country being commercially viable and we hope that companies like BT Open Reach and City Fibre and so on will now move at pace to lay that out. We appreciate that a portion of the country, just as it was with Superfast, will be uneconomic and will need a solution, whether that's public subsidy or a levy. Um, but we're going to do both at the same time. So rather than waiting for those uneconomic areas, rural areas, you know, harder to serve parts of the country uh, to get that, because we see this as part of the answer on the energy and smart homes front and delivery of public services in a more efficient way, we're going to start the uneconomic areas at the same time. And we've got some ideas um, that we're going to be moving forward with quite quickly on how we can get that going and spend some money from the Chancellor's uh, productivity investment fund that we created, infrastructure investment fund, um, on that. And then, sorry, what was the question from you, sir? About Rehabilitating onshore wind. Oh, on onshore wind. Uh, well, I think that's, we don't have a policy in the sense that that's really a decision for the Department for Business um, and Energy at the moment. I don't, the Treasury itself hasn't considered its own view. I mean, we all, our, our interest is on these matters is usually how we can deliver the energy needs for the country at the best value for money so we can keep energy bills for business and consumers down and ensure that we're as economically competitive as possible. Um, but having said that, I, as a constituency MP, you know, I appreciate the views of some of our constituents. I'm sure James said the same thing. Certainly in my area, uh, representing the, the flat but windy parts of the East Midlands, uh, I've been through many years of deep concern by admittedly only a you know, proportion of the population, uh, probably a minority, but a very vocal one. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So I'm going to say thank you to our panellists and thank you for Energy UK for supporting this event.